Well, hello everyone and uh, good evening. And we want to uh, welcome you along here. Um, good evening to those of you in the, I guess, the Western Hemisphere. And um, maybe it's good morning for you if you're on the other side of the world. Uh, but regardless, uh, we just want to uh, welcome you to uh, Toronto Apologetics. Uh, we're glad to have you along and uh, we have a fantastic show uh, tonight. So Toronto Apologetics is a Christian ministry dedicated to uh, the defense of the gospel of Christ. And uh, we're here to uh, deal with uh, all types of topics, uh, theological, uh, philosophical. Uh, we deal with a number of controversial subjects as well. Uh, but these are topics related to, uh, again, the Christian faith, uh, giving reasons for the Christian faith. And so tonight we're going to be talking about two things. We're going to be talking about the world's oldest alphabet. And we're also going to be talking about the Exodus and uh, the dating of the Exodus. And if if you've been watching um, the documentary Patterns uh, of Evidence, you probably are familiar with that topic. And so today uh, I've uh, invited on a, a very special guest um, uh, who is uh, an academic colleague, but also uh, a brother in Christ. And so I want to welcome on uh, Dr. Douglas Petrovich. Uh, so, uh, Douglas, it's great to have you on, and I appreciate you giving of your time to be on tonight. My pleasure, Tony. It's great to be with you, and certainly uh, the topics that uh, I get the privilege of addressing tonight are related to apologetics, you know, very squarely. Yes, and I think that they will be. And so, uh, folks, uh, if you want to know more about Dr. Uh, Petrovich, uh, all that information is in the description box. Um, uh, Dr. Petrovich earned his BA at uh, Moody Bible Institute and uh, earns uh, three master's degrees, two from the master's seminary uh, and uh, the other one, an, an MDiv and a THM from the master's and an MA from the University of Toronto, uh, which is also my alma mater. Uh, I got my BA and MA there. And uh, Dr. Petrovich earned his PhD as well at the University of Toronto. Uh, and so in, in that respect, I guess we are uh, kindred spirits in that uh, uh, we both uh, we both studied at uh, at that prestigious university, uh, and so uh, Doug, if you can maybe tell us a little bit about I know you're a professor of uh, of um, uh, biblical Hebrew and and I believe uh, some other languages and uh, archaeology. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about your your work and your profession? Sure, um, and let me start by saying, Tony, that uh, boy, I miss Toronto. It's my favorite big city in the Western Hemisphere. It's clean. Um, there's great food. Uh, there are lots of pedestrians. It's very safe. Yeah. Um, I, I wish uh, Americans uh, would have a better personal knowledge of the city of Toronto. And I, I can say this. If you want a great city to go visit, go to Toronto. It's it's amazing. And, you know, I moved away long before COVID, so I don't know what the COVID status is there nowadays but yeah. you know assuming that all, all of that's better um boy it's a great place to be and and i miss it and, and i miss u of t i miss robart's library it's yeah. still to this day my favorite library in all the world yeah yeah so, yeah it's a magnificent uh, a magnificent building to be sure yeah uh, but um yeah well it's it's great it's great to hear that uh, you and i both uh, have a point of contact there and and right now you reside in the united states i believe you're teaching at brooks <clears throat> brooks bible college at this at this point yes and i'm in currently in texas I'm, texas i'm just outside of the houston area basically southwestern suburban houston okay. um and i've taught um a total of it's over 50 courses now and a lot of that, the reason behind that is because I'm interdisciplinary. And so biblical studies is part of my background, uh, part of my training. And the other part of my training is ancient Near Eastern history and archaeology. So I, I really wanted to pick a PhD that would complement and enhance the training I received in, especially in the exegesis of the biblical languages of the Bible. So um, I've studied uh, Aramaic, Greek, and Hebrew. And I've taught all levels of Greek and Hebrew over the years at different seminaries, both in the uh, United States, in Canada, and in Siberia, Russia. Wonderful. Wonderful. So, um, yeah, lots of different uh, opportunities God's given me. Yeah, and I was really, I was really encouraged uh, when I read about your ministry in, in Siberia. And uh, so you're not just an academic, but uh, you're also uh, a faithful Christian. And uh, and so 
the wonderful thing about this is that you bring an academic mind to the to the to the table, but at the same time you uh, you you serve the Lord and uh, you minister uh, to uh, to uh, Christians in in Siberia. And I believe that this is this has been going on for a while now, or has been uh, for a number of years. Yeah, and you know when we were there, um, it was a total of ten years. And we really got the opportunity to build into the Russians and to train them and basically work ourselves out of jobs, which is what we did. Right. So after 10 years, we, we turned it over to them. But the irony, Tony, is um, I, I kind of wore several. And this is how it works. It, what missionaries say is true. Yeah. You have to wear a lot of hats yeah. when you go overseas. And yeah. um, so we built a seminary from scratch. I was the assistant to the president. I was the academic dean. And I taught more classes than any of the other uh, professors that we invited to come and be a part of the team. Um, and on the side, I was a church planning pastor wow. in a neighboring city called Berdsk, which um, was wonderful. I loved it. I loved the people. I loved the opportunity. Um, and it was, you know, to this day, I would say it's probably the best 10 years of my life. Right. Wow. That's amazing. What a testimony. Um, so, so Doug, uh, take us on a, a journey here. You're, you're going to talk about the world's uh, oldest alphabet. When people think of the world's oldest alphabet, um, a lot of people tend to think of Sumerian, uh, the the cuneiform uh, uh, tablets, uh, 3300 BC or so. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you mean by the world's oldest alphabet and how that's different from uh, the Sumerian language? Sure. And really, it all does go back to Mesopotamia. Um, in the later root period, right before the the, the, the archaeological period when writing began. And so the later root period is right before the Jemdet Nasser period. It's in the Jemdet Nasser period that we have the actual full-blown advent of writing. But before this, for several periods, we, they were kind of moving toward this. Um, they were jotting things down. Um, there were envelopes that were made, you know, by, uh, made of clay containing, um, uh, tokens that were inside of them mm -hmm. and then writing um, was was doubled up so there was writing on you know there were tokens and there were there was writing with with the tokens and there was writing on the outside of the envelope and that is what led to the, this concept of a cuneiform tablet a clay tablet which would be yeah. about this size roughly yeah. and um in, in in that phase in the later root period before we had full-blown writing they were jotting things in different ways. They were making wedge shapes. They were making uh, slashes or, or lines, if you will. Um, they were making um, pictographic drawings, so pictures. They were making yeah. pictures, um, and you know, one or two other things, and and impressions. You know, just mm -hmm. not like impressions. Right. So, with all of this milieu. Um, at the end of the later, near the end of the later period, we had this um, upheaval that took place, which in a book I'm writing now, um, it's on the third millennium biblical history. I'm going to try to prove that the Tower of Babel event took place during the later root period. Right. And so what happened is all of the, of the technology that was in use at the time went with the people as they dispersed outward from Southern Mesopotamia in all directions. And so they took with them um, material culture, their, their pots and pans and the technology of how to make them, right. their um, weapons and their tools, their architectural designs. And in all of that was this concept of what was just on the edge of writing of actual words, if you will, in, in some form or another. And so what happened then is the people who stayed around in Mesopotamia, they took on this wedge shape um, writing method and turned it into their own script. And that's right. the oldest known script. It's a cuneiform script and it's a syllabic script, which is a fancy way of saying uh, what they would draw would represent, depending on how many of those uh, wedge shapes there would be, their directions, right, the pitch right. of it. Um, all of that would determine um, a, well, you could kind of read it as a whole and then determine it's a certain syllable. So it's right. a consonant and a vowel, like ba, b, mm -hmm. boo, ba, that kind of thing. Right. And a vowel. And then you just change the consonant or change the vowel according to the pattern. 
So that developed first in Mesopotamia, as far as we know. And then in Egypt, not too long after, really not that long after, we see this, this outbreak, if you will, of a writing system, which was pictographic. And remember, early in Mesopotamia's history, that was one of the options that they were writing with, if you will, just not writing words. Mm -hmm. But the Egyptians decided, well, what seems best to us is this pictographic method. So they turned it into an art. Uh, they ended up making over 800 signs that we call of the sign list. And these 800 signs are hieroglyphics today. Mm -hmm. And so that was the second known as far, again, as far as we know, it's, it's the second known script to come along. And I describe all of this in the first chapter of my first book, The World's Oldest Alphabet. Then the third oldest script basically springboards right out of uh, hieroglyphic Egyptian, right? And that script is an alphabetic script and it takes place and you really can't dispute this. I mean, people still do dispute it, unfortunately, but you can't dispute it. It happened in the 19th century BC, the 1800s BC. Right. right? And we're going to get to dates a little bit more in our, in our second discussion, but who then invented it? And for 150 years, scholars have kind of, uh, well, there have been very few scholars who have engaged in this field. Um, at any one time, you could count on one hand how you know who they are. Right. And at some points, there's really nobody, and then it picks back up. But basically, um, in the in the 1920s, a German scholar named Hubert Grimme came along and suggested that Hebrew is the language behind the world's first alphabetic script. Wow. And he was basically thrown out of the academy. He was ostracized wow. because you know. I mean, this is like acknowledging a global flood, right? right? You just don't do this in the academic world. Right. So he lost credibility. Um, he didn't identify all of the letters correctly. But at the end of the day, he was right that it was Hebrew. Mm. Some of his translations were bogus. And in fact, most of them were, were bogus um, because he, he, just, he didn't have all of the letters um, where the pictograph, the picture matches the right um, consonantal value or the, the, the sound of the consonant. So that's a B, a R, a G, a S, a T, all of those options. Mm -hmm. So um, he didn't have all of that down and they, they basically attacked him for it. And so he was, he was dismissed. Um, and then, you know, from, from the 1920s until my book came out in 2016, nobody really ventured to, to follow in his footsteps and say, yeah, he was wrong about a lot of things, but his basic premise was right. It's Hebrew. Right. right. So that's what my book does. And right. um, I, I want to kind of walk through a little bit of this with you. Sure. Um, so I'm going to share a slideshow with you. Okay. Assuming all goes well here. So hopefully you can see my screen okay. soon. Um, and there it is. Um, so uh -huh. we're going to look at, we're going we're to try to answer this question. Is Hebrew the language behind the world's oldest alphabet? Okay. Uh and have you added it to the screen yet, uh, Doug? I just want to make oh, sure. Um, yeah, can, you can't see it? Uh, I, I can add it to the stream. Oh, okay. Uh, if you want, uh, there it is there. Okay, uh, yeah, if you can make it full screen for everybody. Okay. Uh, let me see. How's that? Is that working? Okay, so they don't see you. They just see your the screen. Okay, that's fine with me if it is with you. Yep, that's fine with me. Okay. So, yeah, we, we're, we're answering. And, Tony, by the way, uh, as a reminder, just interrupt me along the way when there's something that you sure. need explained or sure if you think the listeners would you know be benefited by answering a certain question um so essentially we're answering the question though is hebrew the language behind the world's alphabetic script is grime right and and the simple answer is if you don't mind my reading sure flipping the pages to the end of the book the answer is yes it is and that's what my book the world's oldest alphabet seeks to prove so I'm identifying this first alphabetic script with what I refer to as the proto-consonantal script. So proto means first, consonantal means it was only written with consonants. In other words, no vowels. Right. So if we were going to write in English the word clear, C-L-E-A-R, if we take out the vowels, all you'd see is the C, the L, and the R. That's it. So that's how it was done in the beginning. All right. Um, and as you mentioned, this was documented in a film by mm -hmm. um, the Christian filmmaker from Minneapolis, Minnesota, Tim Mahoney. He came out with uh, the first film in the series called 
the uh, patterns of evidence, the Exodus, and that was in 2014. It was a pretty big hit for Christian documentaries. And then he followed that up in with a 2019 film, uh, Patterns of Evidence, The Moses Controversy. And basically the way it works is this. He was going to focus his second film on the, um, the at what happened after the Exodus, the journey out of Egypt and into Sinai, into the desert. And then he found out about my book, which came out in 2016, mm -hmm. at the end of the year. And he was all excited and he said, we've got to do this. We've got to make our focus on... Um, what script did Moses used to write in and was Moses a historical character? So we're going to address that kind sure. of as we go. So um, there's the cover to my book and the contents include background matters, inscriptions from the e Egypt's middle kingdom. That's the time period of Joseph's lifetime, mm -hmm. specifically the 12th dynasty. The 12th Egyptian dynasty is when Joseph lived. That's part of the middle kingdom. Mm -hmm. And then there are inscriptions from the new kingdom. That's Moses's lifetime. And, um, and that's basically the, um, well, Moses lived a little bit in the 16th century BC and then mostly in the, um, in the 15th century BC. Right. And then I have concluding thoughts, uh, and appendices. So, and then there are 15 inscriptions that I translate in the book. So I've deciphered the text, the script, that's the bottom line. And all of those consonantal values, all of those pictographs that, Scholars haven't known for sure. Which sound does this make? Is it a gut or is it a rut? I went through the process by by uh, by pro actually by process of elimination to right. to determine which options were correct for the given pictographs. Like for the snake, does it indeed make the n sound as everybody's right. been telling us? Right. So um, so then all of these inscriptions essentially demonstrate or, or verify the validity of the thesis. The thesis is something that you try to prove in your book. Right. And the thesis was that Hebrew is indeed the language behind this first alphabetic script. And three of the inscriptions name biblical figures. Uh, and we're going to be looking at um, one or two of those. Okay. So let's figure out how to do this. If we were to um, want to create a um, um, an alphabetic script like they did with English. Let's say English has no script. We right. don't have letters, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. We don't have that. We want to create it. So what do we do? Well, we take something like this. We draw a picture. Right? Again, this is a pictograph. What mm -hmm. is this, Tony? Yeah, it looks like a boat. Yeah. I mean, my artistic skill ended in about second grade, but yeah, that's a boat. <laughs> Mine so, was earlier. Yeah. <laughs> when we see a boat... We just pronounce the b sound. Remember, we're not writing vowels like they did. We're just writing consonants. So we see a boat, we say b. And then, okay, we say, that's good. We got that down, Pat. Let's go to another letter. What's this? Yeah, that's a door. Yep. So what sound does it make? D. Yep, the d sound. So the b and the d. Now, that could be a two-letter, well, two-consonant word, and that's an option. Um but we, we, yeah, in fact, for my purposes, I'm stopping here. That's a word. Now, in English, we have some problems here because, remember, we're not writing vowels. So mm -hmm. this could be bid, like if you're in an auction, you put in a bid. Or it could be bud, like a flower bud. Mm -hmm. Or it could be um, bod, like short for a person's or an animal's body. Mm -hmm. Or it could be bad, right? Right. Lots of options. So that's the problem that you kind of face when you're trying to decipher uh, the ancient script that has, like this, that has no vowels that accompany it. So let's say we're going to start another word, and this is really easy because we're using the boat again, so it's another b sound. And then we have this, and what do you think this is? That's yeah, a gate. Yeah, it's a gate. Bingo. So I made it doable for you, right? <laughs> um, and the gate then would make the what sound? J g Good. Yeah, it would make the g sound. So that's our second word. So what does this say and how many words are here? And again, there are options. But as the writer, I'm trying to help my reader understand what this means. So I can tell you that this is the first word, the b and the d. And by the way, this is exactly as you'd see it in the ancient script, the ancient alphabetic script. 
There's no gap between the first and the second word. Mm -hmm. There's no dot, at least right. not early on. There, you know, there's nothing to separate the words. So you just have to figure it out on your own. You're kind of stuck having to be a good researcher, kind of a Sherlock Holmes. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to do with this, Tony, is... Um, Oh, and one of the other options I didn't even give you for this first word. But, you know, so this is our first word, the but and the duh. This is our second word, the but and the guh. And we're going to do like the Hebrews did, which is kind of like Spanish speakers. You write the consonant, I'm sorry, you write the noun first and the adjective second. So, um, yo tengo um, camisa blanca. Uh, yeah. Camisa blanca. I have a literally... Um, a shirt that's a shirt white, but in English we would switch it to a white shirt. Right. So we start with this, and let's say that this could be a, a, a short e vowel here. So bed, that's our first word, that's a noun. Right. And then we have a b and a g. Well, if we have the short i class vowel here in the middle between these, that's implied, it's big. So we have bed and big. Right. So in English, we would switch the order to big bed. So that's exactly what we have here. I just wrote, by, by creating this acrophonic alphabet in English, I just wrote big bed as an ancient Hebrew would have written it. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. So what does it say? Big bed. Again, mm -hmm. noun first, adjective second. How many words? Two. So that's how it worked. So um, what I did is I created an alphabetic chart then uh, to show the... Um, all of the, the consonants that are part of this acrophonic um, system, this, this first alphabetic script. So the Hebrew modern block letters are here, and this is how Hebrew has appeared basically since the Babylonian uh, captivity. So sometime mm -hmm. after 587 BC, the first letter, the second letter, the third, the fourth, the fifth, etc. And then let's jump to the third column. This column is the, uh, the way that they actually wrote this letter in pictographic form when the right. alphabet first came into being. So that is the head of a cow or a, right. um, uh, a bull. So right. that's designating cattle. And it's based on the Hebrew word Aleph. So when you write the word Aleph in Hebrew, this is your first letter right here, which matches right. this. And so you, you pronounce this guttural sound that we don't really make in English. We pronounce it. So when you see the ox's head you pronounce that guttural sound behind this letter right so that that's kind of how it works mm -hmm. then this column with how it actually appeared is based on these i'm sorry i, I got this backwards this is the column the second column is mm -hmm. the one that is how they actually wrote it the third column is the hieroglyphic basis for the letters because the hieroglyphs were written by professional scribes in egypt and they mm -hmm. were really pristine about how they wrote. So it's it's a very um, um, ornate form of writing. But the Hebrews, when they wrote, I mean, they're, it's like Mel, uh, uh, Mel Gibson said in The Patriot, they're, they're like farmers with pitchforks. They're just <laughs> shepherds, right? Yeah. They herd <clears throat> sheep and goats. So they're not worried about a perfect, pristine writing. They're just, you know, I want to make sure people know what I mean. And that's it. Right. So these pretty houses here, these are two options for a house. That's how they wrote their house. Um, this is a door, and so they wrote it this way. This mm -hmm. is a man with two arms raised, um, and this is how they wrote it. Very, very simplistic. So this column here, of course, the fourth one, that's how it's written in modern Hebrew. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the English uh, word that's connected to, uh, to the pictograph. And then the Hebrew writing of it. Right. So a bayit is the word for a house in what we call um, absolute form as opposed to construct form. So it's right. house, whereas the word uh, bait would be house of. So house, and there's your house here. Right. So this column is how they wrote it in actual inscriptions that date mainly to the uh, lifetime of Joseph. And in, in a few cases, just a little bit after the lifetime of Joseph. So that's the 12th dynasty. Right. This, and that's the middle kingdom. And then this next to last column is how they wrote it in Moses's day. This is the new kingdom. So if you want to know, gee, how are the Ten Commandments actually written? <laughs> this is your column because right. every letter is represented. In a few cases, like here, we don't have the and the modern correspondence is, is a Tate letter. We don't have a 
an early form of the Tate letter. We don't know how it was originally written. Right. We don't, we don't have attestation of it. We don't have an example of it. But we have an example of it in Moses's day. And so in Sinai 351 and Sinai 357, um, they wrote it this way, or probably earlier, based on this hieroglyph, which they first would have written it exactly like this. Mm -hmm. So this written form in Sinai 112, and this is actually a hieroglyph as my, uh, uh, what I try to prove in both of my books, as Manasseh actually wrote this hieroglyph. Mm -hmm. So this appeared in Sinai 351, and then they decided to simplify this. So they took this left part of it, this like a plus sign, and they yeah. just wrote the plus sign. They took the circle and they circled around that plus sign. And now we have a new way of writing this letter. And right. therefore that form shows up in our last column, which is how letters were written during mm -hmm. the period of the judges and the period of the monarchy, the Israelite monarchy and the Judite monarchy. Mm -hmm. So 1200 BC, 1100, 1000, 900, 800, 700, 600, all the way down to 587 BC. Mm -hmm. This is how the letters were written. So does that make sense? Sure does. Okay. And then um, this is basically the end of the alphabet. We won't go through all of this. Um, but my, um, my chart gives you the opportunity not to just look at the columns, but to look at rows and say, well, how is a certain letter? Uh, let me pick one here. Uh, maybe this one. The letter um, pay. How right. is letter pay, which means mouth in Hebrew, well, there's our mm -hmm. meaning. How was yeah. it written after it first looks like a mouth? And you can kind of figure out that's a mouth. Yeah. Right. In contrast to an I, which yeah. is the right. agging letter. So it, early on, it's written like this. You can see here the, the line between. Isn't that pretty? They mm -hmm. make it like lips, a lower lip and an upper lip. Right. Um, then it's written this way similarly in Moses's day. So that's Joseph's day. That's Moses's right. day. And then, Tony, here's what they do. They take the mouth and they say, we don't need to do to write all of this. Let's cut off most of it and stop right here. We're just going to write that corner and that corner. And here we have it right here. Boom, boom. Mm. There it is. Right. Just the corner of the mouth. And so from then on, the p sound right. is written with a horizontal line and then kind of this, this wedge um, under stroke here right. to, to turn it into, into a corner of a mouth. So that just shows you over time the the letters, if you don't mind the term, they evolved, they changed, they adapted. Why? It's really easy. It's called uh, it's called simplicity. We mm -hmm. don't want to have to keep writing everything so pictographic. Like here, this is a fish, right? right? This letter is a fish. Oh boy, that's a lot to draw. I don't draw fish uh -huh. very well. So. Um, it, it basically, it, you know, simplifies to this, but then it goes out of use because with this letter, there were actually two competing options, right. the fish and this hair. Well, the hair is easier to draw so because the fish is so complex. So right. simplicity's sake weighs in and we just write the hair. But as you go along in time, things simplify, right? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how it works. Um now let's look at two inscriptions, and then we'll we'll kind of be done with with this question of um, um, you know what is what is the language behind the oldest alphabetic script that I'm prove, trying to prove in my book the world's oldest alphabet is Hebrew. So there's an inscription that dates to about 1772 BC, and we can date it because it has a date uh, inscribed on it. It's a a date in Middle Egyptian. Mm -hmm. um, and this is what we what, what scholars call Sinai 376, and it was composed at a site called Wadi Nasib, which is in, um, in, in Sinai. It's in the southwestern part of the Sinai Peninsula. So Sinai 376, again, Dynasty 13 is just a little time after the lifetime of Joseph. Joseph dies a few years before the end of Dynasty 12. So in mm -hmm. Dynasty 13, we have this inscription. Here it is from... Um, uh, a book um, published by a German scholar named Gerster, published in the 60s, I think 1962 or so. It's, it's in my book. And you can see these letters here that are part of this rock cut, rock inscribed inscription. So right. what is he writing here? Well, what I had to do is I had to um, eliminate all the false friends like this. This is a, what, what we call a false friend. This is a line in the stone that's not part of an inscription. So that's not a legitimate stroke. Part of a letter, right? But this is, 
and this is, all of these other things. So I have to determine all that. I write it all in. So I use, uh, elect, I do it electronically and I use magnification in PowerPoint up to 400% um, percent in size. So it becomes massive in size and on your screen in front of you. And then I'm able to write very carefully um, what is that letter. And then I can use edit points to correct my mistakes when I first draw it. So I can constantly improve my work, which is nice. So right. then I remove the picture and I'm left with the letters of the inscription. And one thing interesting about this, Tony, when, you, when I went through this process and tried to decipher this inscription, this letter was not a letter that other scholars were identifying as a letter that's part of the inscription. None of the other scholars identified it. But the problem is once I knew the script and, and I knew the alphabet and I knew that you, you know, you couldn't make anything logically out of these four letters to start one or two words. I knew that we had a problem. You know, mm -hmm. Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> so I went back to the inscription. I looked really carefully. And you know what I realized? Oh, my goodness. There's a letter here that nobody found. And it makes wow. sense too because look at the height of where these lines start, right? Right, right. This starting point is, is much more in keeping with these, isn't it? Yes. It's between you know this one and this one. But this is way down. Why would you start? And this is the first line of the inscription because it's vertical. So this is the first column, second mm -hmm. column, third, fourth, and fifth. And Tony, by the way, this letter was never recognized either. But when I realized this is a, you can't have a one letter word. So I went back to the inscription and said, there's something missing. Is it down here? No, it's not down here. And that kind of makes sense because things kind of stop here. So I looked up here and sure enough, very lightly preserved is a letter that's that's the Y letter. So mm -hmm. I knew, um, again, scholars miss this letter too. So that's all part of the process of discovery. Um, that's that's a thrill. So when you when you then try to decipher this, here's what I come up with. And this is my first word. The red here is a break. So you have that's indicating a break in the first word. And now we're starting the second word. And the right. third word starts here. And again, we just keep going this way. So what does it all end up with? Here it is. The house of the vineyard of Asnath. And then this is a what we call a, um, a conjunction. It's a wow yeah. conjunction. Wow conjunction, yeah. yeah. It's an and um, or whatever, depending on context. Uh, so the house of the vineyard of Asnath. And, um, and here we have its innermost room have come to life. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, and the innermost room have come to life. Um, wait. And... So there, oh, the, the room and innermost um, have come to life right there. This letter and this letter. Mm -hmm. So there it is. That's the inscription. Now, what does this mean? Well, um, there was a, a house in the vineyard. What, what does that mean? Well, I lived in Russia for 10 years, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Russians had what they called a dacha. It's a summer garden. So they'd go to their summer garden. They'd grow some vegetables usually. And they would have this little, what I would call a shack. And they'd live in their little shack or, you know, overnight many in many cases and um, sometimes, you know, just stay in it during the day and then go home at night. But um, that house then allowed them to monitor what was going on. It protected their garden from people and from animals and, you know, other kinds of yeah. intruders and allowed them to be Johnny on the spot in case there's a problem with mm -hmm. the weather. They need to resolve something. So that's it's kind of like that in the ancient world. So there's this vineyard and there was a house like a dacha house and that house protected the vineyard and allowed a person to to work as a vintner there to to tend the vineyard so that the grapes grow well. Right. Well, this is the house of the vineyard of Asnath. Well, who's Asnath? Mm -hmm. That's an easy one. There's only one person in the entire Hebrew Bible whose name is Asnath. It's the wife of Joseph. Right. But. Joseph died about, what is this, uh, almost 30 years or a little over 30 years earlier, right? right. Joseph died 30 years or, or earlier, and he was 120 years old, if memory serves. Right. So probably Asnath is not alive at this point. So this then becomes a house that's built in the midst of this vineyard that's named after Asnath posthumously, after mm -hmm. her death. Right. And that makes sense because she's the mother of Ephraim and Manasseh. And I try to prove in my second book that 
the site where the Israelites live here in, in well, not in Sinai, but in, in Egypt, um, it was settled in the second occupational phase. J Jacob lived there first with his sons. Mm -hmm. But in the second occupational phase, it was run by a mayor with a title, the equivalent of mayor. And that was um, Joseph's el uh, second eldest son, Ephraim. Ephraim, yeah. Ephraim, yeah. So um, the house of the vineyard of Asnath and its innermost room were, and then here is, um, uh, were, or have come to life. Uh, were, wait, I'm sorry. Uh, the house of the vineyard of Asnath and its innermost room were engraved. That's the verb that's here. We're engraved. Right. Um, and, and that is a parallel to what we read about of the first temple, which we call the Solomonic Temple, because that building is known as a bait, house of, or bait, a house. And that same word is used of Asnath's, mm -hmm. um, the house that was built for Asnath's vineyard. That's the word bait. Right. And then we have this word, devere. It's the word used of an innermost room. In, in archaeological terms, we use the word cellar. Yeah. Well, in the Bible's terms, like of the first temple, we use for the innermost room, we use the Holy of Holies. That right. is the most holy sanctuary. So that same word that's used of the, the Holy of Holies, where the, where the Ark of the Covenant was, where God resided inside there, that's used in this inscription as the innermost room of the house, which means you probably have a three-room house or a four-room house with that kind of our architectural plan. And there's an innermost room, just like you have with the temple. So you right. have this amazing parallel between this house uh, in the vineyard in 1772 BC and the temple that's built in the um, 900s BC. Fascinating right. parallel. It is. And then the word engrave and this verb here, kala, the, that the verb is used for the engraving that took place. So somebody's carving something for a purpose. What purpose? To beautify the house that's in the vineyard of Asnath, right? Mm. Well, that same word is used of how Solomon, he did that with same verb. He carved all of the temple's walls with, and there, here's the nominal form of the same word. So the verb and the noun are what we call cognates. They're right. They're exactly the same as one another. He carved all the temple's walls with what? Engravings or carvings, if you want. We can do that in English. Carved carvings of what? Cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers. So this is amazing. You have the same, you have the same vocabulary right. or, or technical terminology for this house as you do with the house of God. So, Tony, how is this not Hebrew? Yeah. No, I could see it. It's it's definitely Hebrew. Yeah. And no other ancient Semitic language uses the word Asnath as a personal name. Right. As, a, as the name of a person. So, um, and then we'll come to the final inscription I wanted to share with you, which is Sinai 3, 361. This is a big one, important one. And I'm dating it to somewhere. It's either 4, 1447 or 1446 BC. I don't have anything to base that on as far as something inscribed on the actual stone. That's it's inferred based on the inscription itself, the, the meaning of the text. I'm right. dating that just to be clear, but I'm confident nonetheless, whether right or wrong, I'm confident. This is found at Serebi uh, Il This is a turquoise mining site also in Sinai, where the Israelites would join an Egyptian uh, team. They would go down and extract turquoise from the mines, and then they would, you know, clean it all off and you know, reduce it to the, the actual um, fine stone itself. And then they would take it back with them and then sell them on the market and right. make a lot of money. It's a, it became a lucrative industry. So Sinai 361, here's the stone. Uh, this is from the, um, uh, yeah, originally from the mine, but it, it ended up in the um, Egyptian Museum in Cairo. Uh, last I heard, when one scholar went to find it there, they couldn't find it. The Egyptians couldn't find it in their inventory, which is hmm. absolutely, you know, raises the hair on your arm if you're sure. an epigrapher. Sure. Works on ancient inscriptions. But that's, you know, the way it goes. So you can see there's writing here, there's writing here. And once again, they're in columns, not in rows. Right. Um, and how do we know that this piece is part of the, of the overall 
um, inscription? Well, here you have it. There's your answer. Right on this one, the edge of this one and the edge of this one, you have a similar etching. Again, call it part of a false friend. It's not a letter, but it's an etching, whether it's naturally made or a person made it. And then we have this one, a second one next to it, and that's copied here. That's, I should, I should say, continued here. So it shows you that this stone originally was together here, not broken off. Right. But in more modern times, that part's broken off. So I do my drawing. I remove my picture, and there's the inscription. Uh, it's interesting, Tony. Um, you see these two fragments of letters here? Yep. And I've superimposed my suggested continuation of these letters here and here, right? All of this. Yeah. But no, until I came along, people were saying, well, these are parts of letters, but they're really small letters, and they're part of this column here, the second column. Right. But once I realized, you know, none of the letters in this region are so small that, that they should be, you know, ending here or here. They should be big like this. So right. I stretched them out, and then I realized, oh, my, they're, these two letters are not part of this column because look at all that space there. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's like an ugly gap between two middle teeth. It just doesn't work. Right. So, but with the third column, if you continue from the snake letter, which makes the n sound, yeah. because nahash is the Hebrew word for snake, one of the right. Hebrew words, all of a sudden you realize, oh, no, these are two letters that continue this column. So I was the first person to come along and say, whatever these letters were, they're part of this column. And I th I'm very confident that, that so, this yeah. is the, yeah, this is That's the, a pay. The, That'd be the pay there and then the followed by yeah. a lot. Yeah. It's either a pay or an olive. Uh, okay. I'm sorry, a pay or an ayin without a without an eyeball. So yeah. it could be an eye without an eyeball. Yeah. And this mm -hmm. is the shepherd's crook that a makes the l, yeah, yeah. the l sound. Right. right from the verb lamad, which means to teach or to learn. So a right. shepherd's crook or shepherd, shepherd's staff was used to spank a child or prod an animal to say, no, no, don't go near the ravine, little sheep. Yeah. So you use that tool to teach uh, the sheep or from the sheep's perspective, it's a tool used for learning. So the right. same word is used of learning or teaching. So anyway, um, that's this column and that's this column. Um, so once we fill in all of the um, wording, you know, figure it all out, which took weeks to do, um, breaking down the words, all of a sudden, um, it was one of these inscriptions, Tony, that just blew my mind because of yeah. two letters right here. This yeah. is a M from the Hebrew yeah. word mayim, which means water. So water yeah. Yeah. starts with a M sound in ma their word mayim, yeah. it's a wave of water. and. Uh, we kind of go, you know, PG-13 or R rating here. This is um, breasts, as in women's women's breasts. Yeah. Yeah. Shadayim. Yes. So um, it's a M and a SH. Mm -hmm. And I said to myself, oh, my, that could be making the word Moshe, which Moses. is the Hebrew yeah. word for, yes, Moses. Oh. And I said, no, 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 it can't be Moses. It can't be. It's too good to be true, right? That's what everybody tells you. Something yeah. like that would be too good to be true. So I tried every option known to man grammatically to make some other word out of this with what follows in the context of what comes before and what follows. And you know what, Tony? I realized that this has to be a noun. It can't be a verb, can't be an adverb, can't be an adjective. It right. has to be a noun. And the only thing that fits in the context is a name. And that name is Moshe. And there wow. happens to be only one member one person in the Hebrew Bible who's ever called Moshe. Right. And that's Moses, the one who whom God called to lead the Israelites out of bondage in Egypt. And it just so happens that this inscription is around other inscriptions that date to the middle of the 15th century BC, which is the right time of the Exodus. Um, and so it makes perfect sense if this is Moses. So what if that's the case, Douglas, if that's the case, then mm -hmm. what what this is, is this would be the first extra biblical document or artifact that contains the name of Moses. Yeah, exactly. And nothing else comes close in age, Tony. That's that's the heart stopping significance, isn't it? Wow. So the reading is our bound servitude had lingered. Moses then provoked astonishment. It is a year of astonishment because of the lady. What does this mean? 
our bound servitude had lingered. We continued to be slaves. That's as simple as it is. Right. And that makes sense because the beginning of Exodus seems to imply this time period that continues. And what, what shows that it continues more than anything is these references that Moses makes to the growing, the growth of the Hebrew people. They're, they're expanding. They're multiplying. They're getting more and more. And then, the, you know, this oppression continues. So the beginning of the inscription, our bound servitude had lingered. Then a day came when this guy named Moshe, you know, if you want to call him a different Moses, go ahead. But what other Moshe is alive mm -hmm. in the middle of the second millennium BC, in the middle of the, um, the, the 15th century BC, um, that's the only one. Moses then provoked astonishment. What happened with the 10 plagues? Moses provoked astonishment. Mm. Wow. There are frogs all over Egypt. <laughs> wow. There are locusts pouring into our country. They're all over. That's what he did. He provoked astonishment. Then let's step back and maybe make a more general statement. Not only did he, you know, here or there provoke astonishment, but this continued on and on. It is a year, a shana, mm -hmm. a year of astonishment. That makes sense too because scholar Christian scholars tell us who, who really have never studied Egypt, Egyptology formally to know how long this would have gone on, right? Mm -hmm. this, this period of the 10 plagues. But they tell us it was about a year. It wasn't a day or two or it wasn't a week or two. It was about a year for all of this. Well, what do you know? This inscription says it was a year of astonishment. What was? The 10 plagues on Egypt. So what are they attributed to? Do they attribute all of this to Moses or to, to the God of Moses? Who's the God of Moses? And remember, Moses asked, okay, God, who do I say sent me? Mm -hmm. God said, tell them I am has sent you. Oh. I am. Yeah, I am. So that's what he told them. The name of our God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is I am. So whoever wrote this inscription, Tony, did not ascribe credit for this, these 10, 10 plagues that, that caused this year of astonishment, didn't, didn't attribute it to the God of um, Moses or Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because remember, this is all new to the Hebrews. They don't, they, they don't know Per, personally and experientially, that, that the right. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob convinced them that he is true, the, the true and living God. So right. they attribute this to the lady. Who's the lady? The word here is Baalat. That's the right. feminine version of Baal. We know right. about Baal in the yeah. time of the kings. That is the male storm god who is the connected to the fertility god, so goddess. So his his um, spouse, if you will, his his deity spouse is Baalat that right. we know of as Ashereth, right. right? So that's the lady. It's Asherah. So this Hebrew person is attributing credit not to God for these things, but to this pagan deity. Right. And you know what, Tony? That shouldn't surprise us. No. Because it says in Jeremiah, God himself speaking retrospectively. Yeah, back when you Israelites were in the land of Egypt, I made myself known to you, and you were worshiping foreign gods. Mm. Right. Well, here it is. Proof in the pudding. Right. There's the foreign god, Baalat, that they were attributing credit to for this, this astonishment that Moses provoked that, that caused this year of astonishment. Isn't that amazing? That's incredible. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, I'm just uh, I'm just really uh, impressed at the fact that we 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 have we I mean we know the name Moses as you know uh, Doug uh, Moshe is not is not Hebrew but actually uh, I mean it, it came from Hebrew lettering obviously but but it was it was given that name by the daughter of Pharaoh she she named him Moshe because mm -hmm. he was drawn out of the water and I think there are some variants in some of the pharaohs like Thutmosis for example I think there are some variants of that name. In yeah. uh, among the Egyptian pharaohs, yeah. Amosa, Tutmosa, mm -hmm. right, right. But that's amazing uh, that we actually have something outside of the Bible, an extra biblical uh, attestation uh, to to the prophet, to the great uh, lawgiver Moses. Yeah, yeah, and it becomes an extremely important inscription to um, 
to help us to establish a credibility for what Moses would write, right? The first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, which remember, and you know this as well as I do, being at the U of T. Yeah. Professors t- around the world are teaching in universities that there was no historical Moses who write right. the, wrote the first five books. It was written in the 600s, 500s, 400s, whatever, 300s BC by this slew of authors who right. somebody came along, compiled it all together, and we have all these writers who've contributed. Well, guess what? This inscription, if I'm right, and you know, between me and you, I'm right. <laughs> I'm right. This blows the documentary hypothesis out of the water. That's why I and my book are lethal to secular scholarship today. Right. That's incredible. Yeah. I mean, when I was studying at the University of Toronto, uh, you know, Velhausen and his documentary hypothesis uh, was being was being taught. Um, One of my professors, I don't know if you remember Professor Revel. I don't know if uh, you remember Professor Revel. Uh, no. But he wasn't really a big fan of the documentary hypothesis. And so he was beginning to see its weaknesses and and the holes in there. But and all this is fascinating stuff. Uh, we have a, just a question here. If I can bring it up, Doug. Yeah. Uh, this is a question here from uh, uh, um, Thessa Revan. Uh, what does what does I'm, I'm assuming he's referring to you, Doug. What does he think of Dr. David Falk's view? Yeah, and it's interesting. David Falk and I studied together. He was in a one-year MA program at U of T, and I had just started my PhD. We were in, um, I think it was my middle Egyptian uh, text class, second year of my three years in Egyptian language. Um, And we started out as fast friends, and David Falk basically, I mean, I, I became like anathema to him when I told him I was of the early Exodus view and he's a late Exodus uh, um, subscriber. And so that, that kind of just colored our relationship. I mean, I always tried to treat him as a friend still and as a colleague. And as far as I'm concerned, I mean, we believe in the same Bible. We don't need to be um, at odds with one another, but um, he never really um, had any interest in giving any credence or credibility to any of my work. And basically, you know, he he's kind of made it a goal to convince people that everything I have to say in, in this realm um, has to be futile, has to be wrong, has to be error plagued and, you know, and so forth. And it's um, it's interesting. It's been an interesting experience for me uh, because a lot of this has been done in public. A lot of it goes beyond simple scholarly disagreement to um personal attacks and so forth, but I have to just kind of let all that go. And, um, um, and that's that, but I I don't agree with his view on the Exodus timing. And therefore that colors a lot of his understanding. Uh, Many of the things that he has to say, I'd agree with hundred percent. And he does excellent research on many things, Mm -hmm. but whenever the date of the Exodus comes into play and it forces him to kind of bend the shape of his thinking, to to mold to um, the the late Exodus view, then he kind of um, he he loses the ability at objectivity and dealing with evidence as he should as a trained scholar with a PhD. So I, I personally I expect more of him. That's the bottom line. I expect more of him, um, and I'm hoping someday he'll he'll agree, um, right? And and he'll kind of see the light. But you know I've tried my best and. Um, it just really hasn't gone the way I was hoping yet. Right. So what do you think is the main obstacle here, Doug, among some of these academics? Is it because uh, there's a narrative that they've been taught uh, and they've so entrenched into that narrative that they're not willing to let it go? Uh, or is it because do you think it's um, I mean, let's face it. We know that as Christians, we know that there is a uh, there is a, uh, a tendency within fallen sinners to 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 push back against God. There's a tendency to rebel against his word and so forth. Um, do you think that the problem here is that you think there's an anti-supernatural uh, uh, undercurrent playing here, an anti-biblical inspired Bible of mm-hmm. you here where the Bible has to basically adapt to uh, you know a humanistic framework ex eventu that these things were written after the fact and, mm-hmm. and there's a lot of fiction and redaction that's gone into the text. So 
because one of the things I'm thankful to to God for, Doug, is that when when the Lord threw me into the University of Toronto, I, I sometimes say that He threw Daniel into the lion's den, uh, he, and He threw me into the critics' den. Uh, and so a number of my professors, I remember, they were uh, amazed that at the end of my master's program, some of them couldn't <laughs> believe that I was still conservative. <laughs> they actually said, I can't believe that you're still holding yeah. to these conservative views. They thought for sure that redaction criticism, form criticism, and uh, yeah, all, all the other forms of literary criticism, they thought for sure they would have broken me. But I remained steadfast. And mm -hmm. I, and in fact, I thank God for that because it's it's just strengthen my confidence mm -hmm. uh, in the scriptures. And so what do you think is the undercurrent here? Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. and Tony, what those professors didn't come out and tell you outright, outrightly is it was their intent to pull you out of your faith in the historicity of the mm -hmm. Bible mm -hmm. so that because you now don't believe in the historicity of the Bible, you all of a sudden have to scratch your head and say, if I can't trust the historical message, can I really trust the spiritual message? And that's right. a valid question. Yeah. If the history is all goofed up, yeah. then what does it tell you about the spiritual message? Can you really trust it? So, yeah. But so I would say this for those kinds of people. Yes, it's it's option B where it's there's a spiritual dynamic and they're fighting against the spirit of God. They're fighting against the convicting spirit of God who would, you know, if if they would bend the academic knee and say, yes, all this has to be historical. And all of a sudden they would say, wow, then that has further implications. Now I have to deal with the spiritual message in the Bible. But my conscience says, I have, it's, it's so seared. I say to myself, I have no desire to change anywhere, you know, anything that I, where I stand on this, this issue, because now I have moral obligations that I will have to I'll have to change my life. I'll have to change the way I the way I live. Some of my practices I'll have to change. Um, some of my views I'll have to change. And I don't want to give up all of that. I don't want to be responsible to, um, you know, to this this deity people are proclaiming and that this Bible is alluding to and that its right. historical messages is affirming. So it helps them in that way. But with someone like David Falk, I would say it's it's option a where uh, and in this case I, there's a scenario here that comes into play very seriously it's considered only acceptable in the greater academic world to say that if there ever was an exodus if the israelites ever did live in egypt the exodus had to happen in the middle of the 13th century bc and that being the case you know well it, let me say it goes back to the work in the 20th century by an archaeologist, mainly and, and more po in a popular sense, by the work of an archaeologist named William Albright. And Albright yeah. came along and he was a real bouncy, um, bubbly personality. And people just kind of believed what he said. He was so strong of a speaker that they all just fell in line with what he said. And what he said was, look, we have no evidence of Israelites in Egypt. I'm mean, sorry, in Canaan from 1400 BC to 1200 BC. Therefore, if there was an exodus, it had to happen in the 13th century BC because only then can Israelites um, live there. And then we also have this Mernapta Mernap stela, yeah. Yeah. this evidence of, and I would date it to 1219 BC, evidence of um, Israelites in, in Canaan and interacting with the Egyptians toward the end of the 18th dynasty, showing us that they were around and, and not in Egypt, but in Canaan. Right. And that's even more evidence added to this um, to, to support um, Albright's position. And so basically everybody kind of just had to fall in line with that. Oh, if there was an exodus, it had to happen in the 13th century BC because archaeology demands it. But right. you know what, Tony? What they failed to say is, oh, and by the way, there's also virtually no evidence per se of Israelites in Egypt from 1200 BC to around 1000 BC. And, and now we have a little bit more so we can go further back in time before 1000. But for the most part, we have no evidence of Israelites um, in the material culture either. So, uh, you know, markers such as the four room house and all of this. So because of that archaeological historical background, it now becomes this, this pill that you have to swallow 
and to become part of the fraternity. And if yeah. you if you believe in an early Exodus view, which by the way, the early Exodus view is the is the view that takes the numbers in the Bible seriously and literally, and it will take you back to 1446 BC. And so, you know, again, if 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 you follow the archaeological evidence that people have been telling us and swallowing that pill, then you have to say, um, okay, it can't be that the Exodus took place in the 480th year before the beginning of the building of the temple under Solomon. It has to be that that number 480th, which it's not 480, by the way. Right. It's 480th, an ordinal number. And right. ordinal numbers, as Casuto has proven, you may know this, cannot um, uh, be used allegorically or figuratively. So it has to be a literal number, the 479th. It's it's 479 and uh, 480th is 479 and change. Right. Um, so it has has to be literally and has to go back to the middle of the 15th century BC. Right. So that's kind of how it works. Right. And and the sad part is that there's good scholars out there like yourself that uh, would not be given a tenured position uh, in, let's say, Yale or Harvard uh, or the University of Toronto if you held to these views. Uh, mm -hmm. they would think you're, you're, you're way too, way too conservative and too right wing and so forth and so on. So unfortunately, a lot of students end up having to, like you said, just take the pill and, uh, and just go with the narrative. Uh, and that's sad because it, it violates their conscience, I think. And, and also your, your convictions yeah. as well. And can I tell you a quick little story that sure. it's fascinating? Um, when I was working on my PhD at the university of Toronto and you know how this works, sure. um, the, the administration, your advisor and the, and your department and your what at the end of it, your dissertation committee, they're like the Pope and all the cardinals, right? Yeah. They have all the power. They, they can do the thumbs up like, you know, like Caesar like Nero yeah. or thumbs down. Yeah. And so all of these findings that went into my first book and my second book. And so, yeah, there's the first book and here's the second book, the new book. Uh, the world's, uh, I'm sorry, origins of the Hebrews, new evidence of Israelites in Egypt from Joseph to the Exodus, which basically gives all of the evidence that I came up with to prove that Israelites lived there for that 480, 430 years, the Bible says they did. But all of these discoveries that, that during my, during my PhD studies, God was dropping me, I, I, I refer to it as dropping me into one gold mine or pot of gold. One, one pot of gold after another, discovering an inscription with Moses' name. You've got to be kidding. Joseph's wife, you've got to be kidding. And it just goes on and on, right? Yeah. I'm just giving you the, the tip of the iceberg. But in the midst of all this, I couldn't tell people at the University of Toronto. Why? Because they would find a way not to let me graduate. And I didn't tell them. Actually, I, in secrecy, I've told a few things to my, uh, my advisor. Uh, Tim Harrison, the son of missionaries, yeah. and he kept that. He kept that, and I was thankful that he kept that secretive. But apart from that, I kept it quiet. And I got, I defended my dissertation, I got my PhD, and then I published my book. And as soon as I published my book, the one most scathing of all scathing reviews of my book was put out by the Hebrew professor at the University of Toronto who was on my dissertation committee. And he was not happy at all. Wow. Incredible. Yep. Incredible. Incredible. Did you want to say something about the dating of the Exodus? Uh, or do, do you have a PowerPoint on that? Or yeah, I do, but do you, you know, do you want to take so much more time now that we're an hour in? Um, well, I uh, do you want to maybe do a bit of a summary on, on that or... Um... If anyone has any questions, by the way, you can put a question in the chat. If you put a, a capital Q there in the chat, I can pick that up and ask uh, Dr. Petrovich. But uh, um, unless you just want to do a summary, I don't want. I'm, I'm being mindful of your time too, Doug. I don't want to go over. We've already done an hour, mm -hmm. uh, going on an hour and forty. Uh, sorry, an hour and ten minutes. So, um, did you want to uh, say something in summary? I guess a summary form of. Yeah, okay. and if you'd like, we can always do a follow-up, a, a second interview at some you know later point. Sure, sure, absolutely. And go into more detail there. But yeah, um, a, a lot of that argumentation is found within my book. Uh, I 
I published a journal article in 2006 in the Master Seminary Journal, my first published article on Amenhotep II and the historicity of the Exodus Pharaoh. And I kind of update that in a chapter in the book. Um, and essentially with that, and this is just one angle to help support this idea that the Exodus happened in the 15th century BC and not the 13th century BC. But part of that is identifying the Exodus Pharaoh. Now, the Bible doesn't name him. Moses doesn't name him. Why? Moses followed typical Egyptian historiographical methodology, meaning it was the, the prevailing practice of the day for writers, for scribes, not to include, for in Egypt, not to include the name of the foreign king or authority figure who was opposing the Egyptian king. You just don't name him. You can call him by a title, but not, not a name. So uh, Moses followed that protocol. But we can know, I think, who that Exodus Pharaoh is because there's so much very clear and decisive, um, 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 a, a set of requirements, I should say, that basically will eliminate candidates left and right. Because whatever your candidate, whoever your candidate is, he's got to meet all of those requirements. It's kind of like in the old Israelite world, right? If you're if you're if you claim to be a prophet, what percent do you have to be right to stay yeah, alive? A hundred. Yeah. Ninety-nine? What about that? No. You're done. Yeah. You know, they kill you, they stone you to death. So you have to get it right. So um, where was I going with this? Uh, about Moses and, and the foreign king. He would not mention the foreign king. Yeah, yeah. And you're eliminating various candidates for the Pharaoh of the Exodus. Right. So if you fail, if you're an, um, that's it. If you're a candidate for the Exodus Pharaoh, or, or I'm presenting someone as a candidate, and if he fails at one of those requirements, let's say his oldest son ends up on the throne as the next king after this guy, right? Or all of a sudden you have to go, bzzz, doesn't work. You have to eliminate him from, from possibility because he fails in that one requirement. Another requirement, his predecessor, the, the Exodus Pharaoh's predecessor, has to be on the throne over 40 years. We know that from what we combination of what we read in Exodus with what we read in the book of Acts. Very clear. He has to have been on the throne for at least 40 years because it's after those 40 years that the guy dies. And the Exodus Pharaoh takes over. So that eliminates a lot of candidates right away. And the candidate that people want to prop up for the late Exodus view, for the Exodus Pharaoh, is Ramses II. Well, here's right. the deal. His predecessor, I forget how many years, 16 <laughs> or 19 years, his predecessor ruled. Right. But Ramses himself ruled into his what? It's insane. 67th year or whatever it was, some exor exorbitant um, renal length. So... You've got it all wrong if you're picking an Exodus Pharaoh on this basis from the 13th century BC. You've got to go with the son of Ramses II, which, by the way, is Merneptah. And remember, the Merneptah yeah. stella says yeah. that Israelites are in Canaan during his reign. So that eliminates a 40-year wandering in the desert. So the, the late Exodus view dies a horrible death. If you're going to really take seriously the requirements in the biography of the Exodus Pharaoh. And, and, and so I put this out to my colleagues who are late Exodus advocates. Show me how your candidate is not eliminated by one or more of the stringent requirements of the biography of the Exodus Pharaoh. Show me. And, you know, prove it to yourself first. Mm. And, you know, put your view on trial. Put your candidate on trial. And if he fails, then uh, eliminate him from your list of possibilities and go on to someone else. And what I try to prove in my book is, hey, if you take all those seriously and you look at them objectively, only Amenhotep II of Dynasty 18 fits all of the measurable requirements of the Exodus Pharaoh, at least the ones I've been able to come Right. Up. So Amenhotep II. Yes. You believe is the pharaoh would have been the pharaoh of the Exodus based on that criteria. Yes, and we can look at his reign more carefully when, at a later time, we, um, you know, do a, a sure. second look into this issue of the, of the Exodus. 
Absolutely. And so I like what you said there, Doug. I, I, I never really uh, knew that, that uh, you talked about how Moses did not record the name because uh, it, it, it would have been, can you explain uh, again the criterion why Moses would not have mentioned the Pharaoh by name? Because uh, sure. you said something about it being a foreign a foreigner. Sure. So in the middle of the fifth, uh, second millennium BC, which is Moses's lifetime, remember mostly the 15th century BC, he, he lives. At that time, the practice of Egyptian scribes who worked under the command of the Egyptian king or what we call Pharaoh, um, they were they consistently uh, followed a practice which was not to write down in their documents, in their historical documents, not to write the name of the foreign king or ruler who opposed the Egyptian king in the battle or whatever the conflict was that that scribe is writing about. Right. right? You don't include the guy's name. And that's consistent across the board. Now think about this. If Moses is raised as a prince of Egypt, he's got to know Middle Egyptian, right? Number one. Yeah. I don't know if I can prove it, but he's got to know it. But number two, even if he doesn't, either way, he's got to at least have seen some of the work of the scribes who were writing things down in Egypt. And they were writing in such a way that they're, they weren't including the names of the foreign kings that Pharaoh was fighting. That being the case, Moses would have had this in his ear and in his mind. Okay, the normal thing to do when you're writing about a foreign king is you don't name the foreign king. So when it comes time for him to compose the Bible, the Pentateuch, what does he do? He follows what he learned from watching the scribes. It's really very simple. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when you say the foreign king, are you talking about enemy kings or? Yes. Uh, okay. So enemy kings. Okay. Yes. Good. Okay. And, and so uh, if you can, maybe, um, uh, Doug, um, in, in patterns of evidence, um, when they talked about the, the dating of the Exodus, um, was it something, I mean, I think in one of your tweets, you said you had some criticism with the uh, Roll's position. Oh, yeah. Uh, I agree with, I disagree with David Roll more than you can shake a stick at. <laughs> and I'm very, very, very grieved at the influence that his work has been upon the Christian community that is not trained in Egyptology. Mm. I can't tell you how much consternation has been created in me as a result of seeing this influence. So yeah, I agree. I disagree with him on a lot. Someday I'm hoping to write either a journal article or a book that attempts to refute a lot of his positions so that people can be woken up to this. But the average Christian who has a high view of the Bible falls into David Roll's writings and says and sees that, wow, this guy, he's willing to stand alone. And you know how we work as Christians. We're, we're supposed to stand alone. That's how it works. Mm -hmm. So we're attracted to what he's doing and his style. But the bottom line is, number one, he doesn't even have a terminal degree. So no PhD. As far as I know, he doesn't have a master's. He only has a bachelor's degree in Egyptology. So he's officially not a scholar. Right. But he's writing books and speaking from the position of authority and as if he were a scholar. And for the Christian community, you need to know this. He's a self pro, -pro claiming atheist. Yes, yes. Well, think about that one for a moment. In a public forum where we where a bunch of people were writing back and forth, he criticized me in front of all the other people and and said, "It must be such a terrible uh, to paraphrase, it must be such a terrible thing that you are con constricted by this thing called inerrancy, that you don't believe in in, in errors in the original writings of the Bible." Right? right. So if you're a Christian listening to me now, think about that one for a minute. Let that one sink in. Yeah. Are you going to trust a person who has such a low view of the Bible and is willing to criticize the, those with a high view of the Bible? You're going to trust that person mm. in an area of history where you don't have training. And all I can say is be extremely careful with what he says. Um, there are others, you know, so not only I, but. Brant Wood and yeah. Charles yeah. Ailing and Scott Stripling and, and others. 
we all to get and Roger Young, we all wish David um, that Tim Mahoney, the Christian filmmaker, yeah. would not have kind of like you know the Pied Piper, you know, l- listen to the tune of the pipe and just followed the piper. Yeah. Um, with David Roll. Um, but remember, Tim Mahoney, and he's a dear friend, he's not a scholar either. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I understand it, why he maybe wouldn't know all the reasons why not to be mesmerized by David Roll's teachings. But the bottom line is we wish, and we've gone to him and we've said, Tim, you need to walk away from this. But he didn't. Yeah. And, and yeah. to date, he won't. But, yeah, yeah. Well, it it just seems like, and I found that very strange that Roll's a, a self-professing atheist, uh, and yet Christians are listening to him, um, and yet he doesn't believe that that God, that God spoke to Moses, and God uh, not only spoke to Moses, but that God sent the plagues and and miraculously delivered them out of bondage and so forth. So it reminds me of that author of remember the Bible codes. Remember back then we had the Bible codes. Yep. And I think it was Dresden, I believe it was. He wrote a book called The Bible Code, and he's a self-professing atheist as well. But he made he made thousands of dollars, thousands upon thousands of dollars on the sales of his book. Uh, and so I, I mean it's it's just very strange that um you 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 you've got self-professing atheists who are becoming superstars in the Christian community talking about something like you said, uh, that are not credentialed in this area. Um, and a, a bachelor's in Egyptology just doesn't just doesn't cut muster. I mean, you need a lot more than that to be an authority in the area. So, right. I see your point, I, and it's very well taken. And 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 I think there's just something in evangelical Christianity, uh, Doug, that there's this mesmerization that Christians become just mesmerized with people, and uh, they just they're not discerning enough to probe deeper. Right, and we yeah. have to do that. Um, it, it's it's like, um, it, it, let's say I, I have a degree in chemistry, a bachelor's in chemistry or something, and I say, um, I found a cure for most cancer, right? Yeah. And and let's say, Tony, you're just um, diagnosed with a certain form of cancer, and it's one of the ones that my drug apparently fits. Mm-hmm. So when you, and this is serious, right? They find that you're in whatever, third stage or fourth stage cancer, yeah. and you need to work on this and get it solved if you're going to live. Are you going to go to people with, you know, advanced degrees in the medical community who've been working on this for their whole lives with their work based on the work of others who've spent their whole lives working on this to treat your cancer? Or are you going to go to me, the guy with a BA in chemistry who says, hey, I found this, you know, wonder drug that will solve, will, will, you know, cure cancer, will destroy the, the cancer cells. Um, are you going to come to me or are you going to go to them? Well, obviously. Uh, when your life's on the line. Yeah, to the professionals, obviously, the medical right. professionals. Yeah, who are credentialed and so forth. And we see so much of this. I mean, I, you know, the one of the great proponents of the, you know, the whole myth of G- Jesus was a, a, myth, a myth. He never really existed. I forgot the author's name now, but I think he had a bachelor's in history. That's all he had. Uh, mm-hmm. And yet he was speaking as if he was a historical Jesus scholar, uh, which he was not. So, uh, and that's a point well taken because I have to be honest, uh, Doug. That patterns of evidence. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff in there. Don't get me wrong, mm-hmm. but you're right. I think I think that, in all honesty, they could have used uh, someone like yourself or a scholar in the area that is an Egyptologist or trained in Egyptology. Uh, I think would be a better fit. So, um, yeah, that's unfortunate. It really is because it, it really was a, a good documentary and. And I know you've done work as well on Genesis as well. This is Genesis history, I believe. So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah. So I, I I I totally get your point, and uh, and I hope our viewers who are listening are catching on to this that uh, that um, to 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 be a credible source. I'm not saying that I'm not saying you need a PhD to be a Christian. That's not what we're saying. But if you're going to be talking about uh, issues pertaining to historical reliability. Um, and then you have someone who doesn't even believe in the narrative that the reason why the Exodus took place. And remember, uh, uh, as well, Doug, as a Christian, you know this, that the Exodus is the foundation of the whole redemptive story. Mm-hmm. That the New Testament um, uh, flows out of that Exodus imagery that Jesus is the new Moses. Jesus is the, he brings about the Exodus from the bondage of sin to freedom in, in Christ and so forth. Uh, and if that event um, was not predicated on God's 
miraculous intervention, then that that just throws the incarnation out, it throws the atonement out, it throws the resurrection out, and so forth. Yeah, you're right. It, it's a critical book. And it, you remind me of the statement that James makes. In, what is it? Chapter 3, verse 1, I believe, where he says, um, let not many of you be teachers, because yeah. as such, you incur a stricter judgment. Correct. And I look, for example, I, I mean, that's widespread and that's applied to what we've just talked about, but maybe in a little bit of a different vein, I'll, I'll put this out there. Um, I look at the people who, scholars, who have published um, co uh, commentaries on the book of Exodus. There's some really good commentaries out there, but those commentaries, uh, well, any commentary, I should say, on Exodus, the book of Exodus, forces you as the commentator to wrap yourself up into the historical, you know, milieu of the time. And you really need to be up to speed with what's going on. Yeah. So really, you need to be well-trained, not only in biblical exegesis, in Hebrew and et cetera, and, you know, um, uh, the Pentateuch and all that, but you need really good training in Egyptology. And so yeah. my question is, why do we have so few, if any, commentaries on Exodus out there by people who are actually trained in Egyptology at the highest level? Why? Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the only one I could really put a finger on is Kenneth Kitchen, the classical work of Kenneth Kitchen on the reliability of the Old Testament. I believe mm -hmm. he was trained in yeah. Egyptology. And I think he's a great resource, but uh, yeah. I, he, I doesn't mean, even I, write, he doesn't even write a commentary on no, Exodus. No, no, no. We have a question here from uh, uh, Toto Ramundo. I'm not even sure about this question, but I kind of heard somewhere in the documentary that Joseph was related to an Egyptian character called Imhotep. Great interview as always. God bless. Are Thank you familiar you, with Joe. that? Yeah, are you familiar with that, uh, Doug? Yeah, and guess who is um, an advocate of the view that Imhotep is Joseph. Uh, that's David Roll. Yeah, I was just going to say that. Yeah. Yep. So um, the bottom line is, if you don't get Egyptian chronology right, precisely, if you don't get Israelite chronology right, precisely, you can't synchronize the two with any kind of care or with any kind of uh, hope for accuracy maybe it's kind of like uh two things one pin the tail on the donkey right maybe blindfolded you could hit that thing but boy what's the chance you're going to or right. it's, it's the watch thing right it doesn't work but twice a day it's correct so maybe you can get something right but boy you're missing out on so much and i'll say this imhotep is absolutely the wrong time period altogether for the lifetime of Joseph. You've got to do, okay, when you build a house, if, at least in our hemisphere, if you don't build the foundation first and you don't build it well, I don't care how well you build your house, it's not gonna last. No. You better build that foundation correctly. So the foundation in ancient historical study related to the Bible has to be that whole chronological historical foundation itself. And so you've got to get these things right. And then once you, you're sure you've lined them up carefully and your synchronization is reliable, then you can start walking over from one into the other and saying, do we have any evidence? Because this is the right time period that matches. But what David Roll's done, this it, it is a methodological nightmare, what he's done. In numerous cases, he'll take, for example, Okay, we read about in a certain papyrus manuscript that there is, you know, there are these, um, there are these potential parallels to the blood that would have been there in, you know, um, where the Nile blood flood, uh, Nile blood um, plague uh, occurred. We see things that happen in Egypt, Egypt's history that may be an allusion to that. So. What we can do then is we can kind of take biblical chronology and move it down or move it up to where this is to make it fit, right? Because right. 
Boy, that sounds like a sweet and juicy parallel. Oh my goodness. This is horrendous. Mm. This is wrong methodology. You've got to lay the foundation of the house first. Egyptian chronology, Israelite chronology, do them separately. Become confident in, in what you have and then talk about merging them together. And when you do, now you have something you can work with. And here's what, what my books will prove, Tony, okay? Mm -hmm. I believe to the objective learner. Sure. They will prove that if you do that work and you hit it, you hit it correctly with the two, the merge Egyptian and, and Israelite chronology together, all of a sudden things fall into place like you cannot believe. You don't have to go looking for the evidence. It's going to find you. Right. And it is powerful and it comes in spades. And in numerous cases, events happened within one year of time that if it wasn't for that, you know, precision in the in the synchronization of the Egyptian and Israelite chronology, if it wasn't for that, the whole thing would be messed up. But it's perfect within a year. Perfect. Wow. In, in multiple times, in multiple eras, in Joseph's lifetime and in Moses's lifetime. Right. What does that tell you? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm always wary about parallels. Uh, I mean, remember, uh, you probably remember, Doug, uh, Samuel Sandel's, uh, Sandmel's great article, Parallelomania, uh, where he warns us about these parallel, you know, seeing parallels here and there, and then something, you know, trying to weave them together. And I like the analogy you used about the foundation. I mean, you can make the house look wonderful. You can make it look like the Taj Mahal. But if the foundation is, you know, Jesus talked about building a house on sand and building a house on rock. And so if your foundation is off, especially that cornerstone where you start, if that is off, then it doesn't matter how nice it looks, it's going to crumble under yep. scrutiny. So you're absolutely right. And, and I think that uh, I think that it's uh, it, it's it's a clarion call for Christians uh, and those in the academic field to 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 pay close attention to that. Yep. But um, thank you so much, uh, Doug. And, and everyone, thanks for joining us. I really appreciate you guys joining us. Thank you for your questions. I know, I know that this is a, uh, a heavy topic for some. Um, and, and so most of you are probably thinking things through and, and considering what has been said. So maybe, uh, in a follow-up edition, uh, Douglas, we can pick up and, and also I'd love to hear your, your take on Genesis as well, because I know you did, you were on the documentary, I think is Genesis history. Yes. And, and so I was really, uh, again, not to go off on a tangent, but I was really impressed by your, uh, I think you put out a, a publication, a published work on uh, Nimrod, Nimrod in Genesis 11 being uh, Sargon, being no. Sargon the Great, I believe yeah. you said. Am I off there or is that correct? Yeah, in Genesis 10, uh, that, no. that, that biblical Nimrod equals Sargon of Akkad. And you, you know what's interesting, Tony? Um, on my academia.edu webpage, which I consider to be the real Facebook on planet Earth. I, I like that, yeah. Um, I, I've uploaded all of my published articles a bunch of unpublished um, papers, um, in reviews, interactions with people, um, teaching aids and other things, right? I've uploaded a ton there. Out of everything I've uploaded there, oddly enough, the one thing that people have, have um, viewed more than anything else is that 2013 article I published connecting Nimrod with Sargon of Akkad. For some reason, People are fascinated by this Nimrod guy. And mm -hmm. so basically I've expanded that and I've turned it into a book and I'm almost done writing it. It's going to be the next book I publish, Lord willing. So be on the lookout for a book uh, by the title um, Nimrod, the Empire Builder. So I'm going to um, go, um, go into more detail on that and expand it. And they can see that. I, and I provided the links, folks, in ac academia.edu. Uh, the links are there. Uh, but I, I just found that really amazing, um, Doug, because there's a, there's a lot of Christians who who build a lot of stuff on, you know, uh, Nimrod and his wife, Simi, uh, Simiramis, and all of this stuff. I think a lot of it comes from, I think, uh, Alexander Hislop wrote a book called The Two Babylons. And I think there's a lot of, I, I mean, he wasn't, I mean, th there was some shoddy work there. He wasn't an archaeologist. He was an archaeologist. He was not an ancient Near Eastern historian. But I think a lot of evangelicals will base a lot of this, you know, paganism that we find in various parts of Christendom. They'll associate that with Nimrod 
And uh, but but I really appreciate you doing that because um, I mean I, I just finished a course teaching a course on archaeology and we talked about Sargon the Great and 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 Sargon of Akkad and Sargon the Second and so forth and so on. But uh, that's that sounds like an amazing amazing uh, article. Uh, and so by way of encouragement, uh, there's uh, Jojo Monster Monster says. Hi, Doug. Just volunteer himself to write a documentary on, on Exodus, a, write, a commentary on Exodus. Yeah, in fact, it's on my to-do list. The bad news is my to-do list is getting longer all the time. But yeah, uh, if I live long enough, I will be writing a um, historical and exegetical handbook on uh, Exodus, at least Exodus 1 through 12, if not beyond yeah. that, but at yeah. least on that. Yes. That's a lot of work. And, and as you know, Doug, uh, being an academic myself, Time is our mortal enemy. I mean, there's only so many hours in the day. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's only so many days that God has given us on this earth. And so uh, we we have to make the best of it. But uh, if you were to ever write a, a commentary on Exodus, I, you know, that'd be on my, you know, that'd be one of the books I'd want on my bookshelf. So for sure. So thanks again, uh, Doug. I, and I appreciate your time. I don't want to take any more of your time. Thank you. Thank you for being on, for shedding a lot of light on, on this very important topic. And, uh, and uh, and folks, once again, uh, all all the information on Dr. Petrovich's books are all in the description box. I would encourage you to go there. You can follow him on Twitter as well. He, I, his Twitter handle uh, is there. You 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 may want to get that book, The World's Oldest Alphabet. Uh, you don't have to read Hebrew necessarily because I think Dr. Petrovich does a great job of breaking it down, transliterating, and helping you to read those ancient inscriptions. So uh, thanks again, Doug. I really appreciate you and appreciate your work for uh, the kingdom and also there's an academic uh, integrity that you have. My pleasure, Tony. It was great yeah. to be with you. Thanks for a fun interview. And I look forward to future interviews together. Look forward to it. Look forward to it. So everybody, thanks again. God bless you all. And I uh, hope to see you again in the follow-up uh, follow show. Take care. All the best. Bye for now.